So we are going to switch to English and welcome everybody. Good morning in Latin America. Good morning in Santiago in Mexico and good evening in Australia. Welcome again to the second webinar as part of the activities of the Dentistry Group of Universitas 21. As you know, this uh, webinar were planned by my institution. I'm Constanza Martinez, a professor at the Dental School of Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. And as, and as I told you before, this webinar was planned by my institution together with the University of Melbourne and also with the Tecnológico de Monterrey. I shared the, the panel with Dr. Jorge Martinez, who uh, are going to speak, who is going to speak to us today and uh, with colleagues from my institution, Dr. Sebastián Aguayo and Dr. Bruna Benzo. And today we, ha we have the honor to have with us Dr. Jorge Martínez, professor at the Medicine and Health Science uh, School of Tecnológico de Monterrey, who is going to share with us his huge knowledge related with, related with restorative treatments with dental implants in the aesthetic zone. He will have about one hour to share with us his presentation. And at the end of the session, we are going to open the discussion with uh, four questions. Remember that you can write your questions by chat or using the question box. So let me introduce you to Dr. Jorge Martinez. He graduated uh, as dental doctor science from University of Nuevo Leon. And he was the best student in his class received his degree of maxillofacial surgeon at Lopez Mateos Hospital in Mexico City. He did a fellowship in osseous rigid fixation at Canton, Canton Hospital Basel in Switzerland, and a second fellowship at University of North Carolina. He is certified by the Mexican Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons member of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, fellow of the International Team for Implantology. He's all author of the book, Cirugía Oral y Maxillofacial, published by Manuel Moderno. At Tecnológico de Monterrey, he is professor of oral surgery and oral implantology and director of the Health Science at Medicine and Health Science School. Also, he has called a private practice in maxillofacial surgery and oral implantology since 1998 until today. So Dr. Martinez, we are very grateful to have you here today with us and welcome and go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Constanza. Um, I appreciate, it's an honor to be here with you all. Uh, thanks to you and, and your team in Universidad Católica the Chile and also thanks to the dental group in, in U21. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, um, <coughs> so this morning, I wanna tell you from all of you who haven't been here in Monterrey, Monterrey is, is in the north part of uh, Mexico. Uh, our university, Monterrey Tech, uh, is situated here. This is our Saddle Mountain, and this is our campus in, in uh, Monterey City. And this is our health science campus. Here is uh, San Jose Hospital. This is our uh, medicine and health science school. And this is our clinic, our dental uh, clinic in Monterey. So today I would like to talk about dental implants in the aesthetic zone. Um, I think it's always a challenge to do things uh, the proper way in this area because it is in the most visible area of the mouth and any problem, any situation could be seen uh, 
very easily. So I would like to share with you some concepts about uh, bone biology and some uh, principles of uh, implant design and surfaces. So as you all know, uh, our bone, our alveolar bone will be there when we have teeth. When we start losing our teeth, our bone will start resolving away. Actually, if we compare the cranium of an older uh, person, will look alike uh, the one of a baby because there are no teeth. So, uh, Lake Coleman Sarf in 1985 uh, proposed this uh, classification that we, we still use today from uh, bone densities. And that goes from mostly cortical bone type one to very poor, uh, thin, absent cortical bone. And uh, for a lot of years, this type four uh, bone was believed to be a very poor quality, uh, actually, but that has changed during the past few years uh, because of the understanding of how uh, implants uh, heal. So uh, this is a mostly trabecular bone, but has undifferentiated mesenchymal cells that will become osteoblast and also has rich vascularity. And by that, we have a lot of osteoclasts that will remodel the bone. And we have endothelial cells that will cause angiogenesis. So biologically, this is a superior quality and it's ideal for fast and efficient healing uh, process. So if we compare the, the cortical bone to the trabecular one, uh, primary stability, of course, will be better in the cortical bone, but remodeling speed, osteogenic capacity, and vascularity will be a lot better in trabecular bone. So about dental surfaces, one of the uh, most uh, used today is SLA, which stands for uh, sandblasted large grid acid edge. It has uh, some advantages. Uh, it, is, it, of course, increases bone to implant contact and it also uh, will reduce the speed of, uh, of uh, healing into six to eight weeks that the ones, the, the person that has been in implant dentistry for some years will remember that at the beginning we will have to wait a uh, few months. But not only the bone to implant contact is one of the advantages. In this study, uh, Kiss Witter uh, showed that by having this kind of surface, uh, it, had, it, it stimulates the bone and produce bone cells uh, with uh, more uh, growth factors. This is how it looks microscopically. And probably the state of the art would be SLA active surface, uh, which is the same uh, topography microscopically. But after that, uh, there is a nitrogen conditioning in the surface and that will hold the biologic activity of it. And with this surface, now the healing process will uh, be in three to four weeks. So this is pretty much uh, the state of the art in, in uh, implant surfaces. Now, the relevance of hydrophilicity is pretty much the difference. Uh, it is all the, the titanium surfaces are hydrophobic, but this hydrophilicity will uh, enhance cellular interaction. And of course, it will enhance healing uh, process. So, as you can see here, this is the higher hydrophobic uh, uh, type of uh, titanium. And look how the fluid um, is uh, acting completely different in the SLA active surface. So by that, that will attract the, the blood and the, the, the cells in it. And the undifferentiated cells will become osteoblasts and will uh, be adapted to the surface of the implant and produce a bone matrix. 
So what are the clinical advantages of it? Uh, of course, it will shorten the osteointegration integration time, uh, but also will increase treatment predictability. And uh, of course, it can be used in immediate uh, loading protocols with uh, better chances of success. We have to remember that uh, when we place an implant, we have an inflammatory phase, then we have a proliferative phase in which we have a steroid around the implant and then a maturation, maturation phase. So whenever we have a problem in the prolifer proliferative phase in which we have a, some kind of movement in the implant, that will create uh, a, some kind of uh, uh, scarring tissue between the bone and the implant. So uh, that uh, uh, window of, of uh, problems can be shortened with the SLA active surface. So here you can see in the green line how the primary stability will drop after placement. And normally the dot uh, uh, blue line represents how the secondary or biologic stability or osseointegration integration comes along, but after seven to eight weeks in order to have the same uh, stability. With SLA active, the uh, secondary stability will uh, become very, very high after three to four weeks. So this uh, represents in the clinical setting that the, the loss of, of primary stability will be very, very uh, little after placement. What about soft tissue interactions? At the beginning, people didn't pay too much attention to um, the design from the uh, biological point of view. The signs were more uh, mechanical, but that changed with time. Uh, the surface treatment at the beginning was uh, pretty much focused to the threats of the implant, and now, uh, we talk about microtopography and the stimulation of the cells to produce bone matrix. And the soft tissue interaction, instead of having some uh, swelling and tolerance to the implant, uh, now we have much healthier tissue around uh, our implants. So the first implant didn't pay much attention, as I said, and at the interface with the abutment, we had a lot of bacteria. And by having that bacteria, that uh, translates in bone loss. As you can see, all uh, x-rays will show that uh, with uh, that kind of implant design. So we need to remember about biological uh, width. And if we respect that distance from the prosthesis to the bone, that translates in better quality of soft tissue around the implant. So all these red areas are just blood cells, uh, blood uh, vessels uh, that trans, uh, are translucent through the tissues. But this is a very healthy situation. So there are two ways of uh, having implants, soft tissue implants or uh, bone level implants. Uh, in both, we can have a distance from the bone, just the bone level one will have a horizontal offset and the other will be a vertical offset from the bone. In both situations, we want to have our prosthesis away from the bone. So the design of implant has changed for years, and now we have very aggressive threads for immediate uh, loading protocols, but the biological design is pretty much the same. That has to be kept in order to have a long-term success. This study, what they show is uh, they uh, compare 
external connections to internal connections, specifically to Morse paper connection. And most uh, uh, Morse paper connection has shown to be a lot more stable than the external uh, uh, connections. Uh, pretty much the, the most important thing is that uh, it, it reduces abutment uh, implant interface and by that reduces the biofilm and that translates in less uh, rate of peri-implantitis, less rate of uh, bone crest resorption. Uh, that uh, small abutment diameter will help to have better vascularity in the soft tissue around it. And of course, less rate of micro movement. Now, again, what is uh, the clinical relevance of that? Well, uh, these kind of connections with that friction, the, the internal connection and being away from, from the bone will help to uh, really have a very healthy soft tissue that translates in a long-term stability of soft and hard tissue, as you can see in these x-rays. So let's uh, check some um, clinical cases. Uh, this lady came to me after having an implant failure. She had an implant done, she had an infection, lost the implant and lost some bone, as you can see here. When we raise the flap, we see all this bone loss, a concavity in the buccal area. And, and even when we start uh, using our pilot drill, right away, we can see how uh, we have a fenestration. So instead of keeping with the drilling, we use some osteotomes in order to expand the, the, the bone around the, the osteotomy area. We place our implant and we have this thread fenestration, but we use some bone around it. We scrap the bone from here, like Dr. Busser uh, proposed some years ago. And we have this uh, uh, bone on top of the thread and after that, we use just slow resorbing uh, hydroxyl apatite and a membrane uh, to cover it. So we put the uh, flap in its place, we suture. This is how it looks in the x-ray. And after three months, this is uh, the kind of healing she presented. And I want to show you uh, this detail in the uh, prosthetic that is going to be used provisional. This shape will create some space in these areas for the soft tissue to come down and uh, create some papilla as it happens here. So it is important for us as oral surgeons to create very good uh, quality of uh, soft tissue and volume of soft tissue in order for our uh, prosthetic doctor to modify uh, the soft tissue, mold the soft tissue and create papilla. So this is definitely uh, a teamwork that uh, will be needed. But what does success mean in uh, implant dentistry? Some authors propose absence of pain, no sensibility alteration, absence of infection, absence of uh, mobility, absence of radiolucency, less than two millimeters of uh, bone loss, absence of gingival inflammation. But if you take those things into account, all of these cases will or could be called successful. However, they don't look alike. So uh, what is the difference? For Hauser in 2005 proposed this uh, pink aesthetic score. And he was uh, giving some uh, points to every little detail of the result. So you can look at mesial papilla, distal papilla, level of gingival margin, the curvature of gingival margin, root contour shape or convexity and soft tissue color and texture. So with all those, you can get a 10 uh, point score and it's a lot more uh, detailed than 
the other way of measuring uh, things. So again, what is the difference? If I would have to, to pick one of the uh, most important factors, I would say proper positioning of dental implants is one of the most important factors uh, for successful implant placement in the aesthetic zone. So three-dimensional positioning of the implant will include vertical depth, buccolingual position, buccolingual inclination, uh, mesiodistal position and type of implant. I'm gonna go through all of those in more detail. Some years ago, uh, people used to say, uh, place the implant where the bone is. And this was pretty much uh, the result of that. But when you compare the position of the implant to the prosthesis, uh, the relationship is not uh, very uh, uh, proper. So nowadays, we talk about place the implant according to the plant prosthesis, and that is called prosthetically driven implantology. So we need to take a look at where the prosthesis is going to be and place the implant accordingly. And if by having that situation, we have this uh, fenestration, we will go ahead and use some type of bone graft and cover it, but this is the way things should be. No more, uh, place the implant where the bone is available. Now for that, we use surgical guides. Um, we have pretty much two types of uh, surgical guides, restrictive and semi-restrictive uh, in both. Uh, one of them is freehand, but showing you where you should be in the occlusal surface. And the other is guiding uh, in a restrictive way your, uh, your drill. I want to share with you this video because it represents it fills my heart we, we do free hands, so we improvise and sing, and all my problems go away. the way they should. So I would say improvisation is not a very good idea. In this sunny day. So vertical depth, this is in the alveolar process how deep you're going to place your implant in the buccolingual position is in the body, how close to the buccal or lingual surface you will be. Buccolingual inclination is a different situation. And mesiodistal positioning is how close from the neighboring implant or tooth you're going to be. And, and of course, we need to take into account type of implant. We have soft tissue implant and we have bone level implant. So in terms of vertical depth, nowadays in the, um, in the aesthetic zone, we talk about three to four millimeters on the senate, on the, on the uh, most superior area of the senate and, and, and uh, in the uh, gingival contour. Of course, in the mesial or distal uh, area, we will have a lot more than that. We could have seven, even eight millimeters. And that is why it's very important to try to place the implant and screw, uh, use the screw retain uh, crowns because if you use cemented uh, uh, crowns, you could have some cement here and it will be very difficult to take it off. So in buccolingual uh, position, we need to be inside of the alveolar process. That's the most important thing. We need to keep our implant inside of uh, the anatomy of the alveolar process. Whenever we fail doing that, this will be the result. And there is no bone graft that will be able to cover that. So it is, uh, this is a very important uh, issue in implant positioning. Buccolingual inclination. We need to remember that uh, uh, teeth have two different uh, axes. One of these is the root and the other angulation is the crown. In the implants, we don't have that. So we need to place our implant according to the uh, prosthetic uh, crown and uh, try to use 
in the anterior area, this position in order to use screw retained prosthesis. So as you can see in this same case, that also fails. When we take a, a CBCT, we can see in that same case how the, the implant is also integrated, unfortunately, in the very uh, bad position. Measure distal position. This is how close to the neighboring teeth you are going to be. And this is a matter of um, blood flow. We can be as close as 1.5 millimeter to a natural tooth. And that is only because we have a periodontal ligament which is very well vascularized. Between two implants, since we don't have periodontal ligament, we need to be three millimeters away. When we fail to do that and we compromise vascularity, this will be the result. We will have uh, bone resorption and of course, uh, soft tissue resorption. Same thing happens when we uh, use a lot of implants in a small area. It is better to uh, put them a little uh, uh, distance in between or in the centrals with some cantilever uh, in the rest of the teeth. Now, sometimes we have a situation in which we need to extract the tooth, but everything looks healthy. Can we do immediate implant placement? First of all, we need to do a very atraumatic extraction. And for that, we have periodontons, we have uh, mechanical devices, and we have dental sectioning. In my case, my preference is dental sectioning, uh, probably because I'm oral surgeon. And even if you have one root, you can do this kind of procedure in which you can uh, use a burr, cut, and take uh, a little piece. By having this room, you can luxate the rest of the root and keep a very good bone for immediate implant placement. So that's what uh, we decided to do in this case. We did the extraction. As you can see here, there is a very good quality of bone. We start doing placement. This is the implant we used. Bone grafted on the buccal area, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. And I want you to look how the position of the implant looks weird. And I'm gonna explain that in a minute. Look at this distance from the buccal uh, surface. We need to talk about how the socket heals. And uh, Mauricio Araujo, a Brazilian guy, is uh, probably the best authority in this uh, kind of uh, topic. And what he showed to us is after an extraction, we will have a lot of bone resorption on the buccal surface. So after one week, two weeks, three weeks, uh, four weeks, and eight weeks. If we compare what is happening to the alveolar process, you will see that we have some resorption on the, on the lingual surface, but a lot of resorption on the buccal area. So uh, this is something very important. Now, in this other study, uh, they talk about this very thin buccal uh, wall and how it can be uh, preserved in a tooth, but it will go away after an extraction. And the main reason for that to be kept here is again, the periodontal ligament. This periodontal ligament is not only giving support and giving um, sensibility, but also it has a very vascularized uh, situation that will keep the bone. Once that goes away, that uh, buccal surface will resorb. Now, can we use implant placement to stop bone resorption? Again, Araujo uh, asked this question, put some implants in dogs. And that's what showed us at the day of uh, placement. Look, this is the buccal and lingual area after four weeks. And after two weeks, look at the bone. Even one thread is already exposed in the bone. 
So that is the healing, no matter if you use or don't use a dental implant. This is a patient that came to my office and asked me, why did I have so many bone grafts? How long do you think it's gonna take to have my tooth back? She was uh, being treated by another oral surgeon of uh, the city. And I asked her some uh, tomographies. And unfortunately, this is what we found out. Look at the implant placement. This probably was placed uh, as uh, immediate uh, extraction, but the position, instead of being here in the lingual area, was probably placed exactly in the alveolar process. Probably the alveolar process was here. And of course, a lot of that resorption that we just talked about uh, caused this situation. And this is a very difficult situation because the patient um, has uh, an osteointegrated implant in a very bad position. Now, there is not only the placement of uh, the towards the palate, but also we uh, need to graft the gap. And, and here is a study in which they compared using graft against not using anything. And uh, of course, they conclude that using um, graft significantly reduces horizontal uh, bone resorption uh, resorption uh, changes let's have this clinical case uh, this tooth is going to be missing because of uh, this external resorption internal external resorption and we have to uh, change the angulation of the implant and um, try to do immediate implant placement. So we tried to do a very careful extraction. Uh, the bone was preserved. And again, we need to drill against the palate and not against the apex. So we did that. This is the provisional that will be used attached to the neighboring teeth. And this is uh, the final illustration. This is a similar case in which, well, I, I wanna tell you this. This is the, one of the ITI graphics, the International Team for Implantology, uh, but this was some years ago. Nowadays, we don't want to do this. We want to take our implant and move it towards the palate and leave very big space on the buccal uh, area and graft it. So uh, by that, we can have a better uh, situation long-term. So that's what we're going to do in this case. Again, the extraction, placement against the palate. And this is what we do, at least uh, in our clinic. We use a round burr here to make a, and stop. We use our pilot drill and we go in this angulation. Once we create uh, that path, we follow with our implant and we graft all this buccal gap. So again, coming back to our case, this is the situation we're placing the implant and this is the bone graft we used. Look at the location of the implant, the bone graft, and the healing abutment. So this is the provisional restoration. Again, that same shape to create papilla. That's the provisional. That's the shaping of the soft tissues. And this is the final restoration. Very, very important positioning, proper positioning of the dental implants, distance to the buccal, to the neighboring teeth. And this is a follow-up, five years follow-up. So this is a bone level implant, and this is a soft tissue level implant. Doesn't matter which one you use, 
if you put it the right uh, position, if you respect biology, uh, results will be fine. Can we do immediate implant in bulk of osseous defect? Here we have this uh, infection in the right upper incisor. And we have this, I'm gonna show you in a minute, this fenestration in the bone. We place the implant against the palate. And look at this uh, paper. What about healing of buccal dehiscence defect at implant installed immediately into the extraction socket? This was in dogs. And what they did is creating a, a bone defect in the buccal area. In one case, they put the implant against the buccal area and the other placing the implant against the palatal uh, surface. And what they found is whenever you put your implant against the palate, you will have better um, healing. So the placement, the conclusion is the placement of implants in the lingual position of extraction sockets allowed higher degree of bone formation on the vocal area. So according to that, we can do this. We're gonna go ahead and, and uh, use uh, some uh, soft tissue uh, periodontal recontouring to crown, uh, in order to do crown lengthening for aesthetic purposes. This is our guide. This is some bone graft that we're going to use and a membrane, very little flap. And I want to call your attention. This looks very funny. We talked about uh, that uh, to our patients every single time. We want to allow the soft tissue to grow as much as we can before we start molding it with the provisional from the implant. So this is important. As much soft tissue as we can is better, then we can mold it with a, a provisional restoration and create the pillar so we can go from this situation to this uh, final restoration. Now look at this different case. Here we have some deformities. Should we do tooth extraction and immediate implant placement? Here we have a gingival margin discrepancy, mesiodistal discrepancy between central incisors. This is wider than this one. Gingival margin deformity. And we don't have very good bone availability. So we're going to extract the uh, left upper uh, central incisor and wait for natural healing in order to get better soft tissue. We're gonna do a gingival plastic procedure here and orthodontic uh, repositioning of the teeth and place an implant. So we go ahead and do the extraction. This is the periodontal uh, correction that we did. Look at this how we leave our provisional here and look after two months. We have a lot more uh, soft tissue quality and quantity. So waiting for that phase back here, we have a lot better situation uh, talking about soft tissue. So we went ahead and, and raised our flap, placed an implant. We had some bone deficiency. And this is what Eduardo Anitua, the Spanish guy proposed several years ago to drill very slowly. And by having that situation, you can collect a lot of very, very good quality uh, of uh, bone graft. So we can cover our implant with that, then a slow resorbing, then a membrane, resorbable membrane of collagen. And this is how the healing happens after two months. This is provisionalization after one and two weeks. This is the final prosthesis. This is how we started and this is how we end up. So sometimes it's better to take a step back and do things slowly. So in most uh, difficult cases in which we need uh, 
more quantity of uh, or higher quantities of uh, uh, bone graft, we can always use different areas of the mouth. Uh, one of my preferable, preferable areas is uh, the um, bone in the ramus of the mandible. It has very slow rates of uh, resorption, very stable. And this is an example in which we use that. So if we analyze this case, we have upper central incisor with root uh, canal therapy, root fracture, bone loss, gingival tissue recession, multiple gingival, uh, gingival recessions. And the treatment plan is do the extraction and let it heal in order to get some uh, soft tissue, then use an only graft and wait for uh, four months and then place an implant. So this is how we begin our case. This is the soft tissue healing. How, look at uh, how the, the, the bone loss is uh, very uh, important, but now we have uh, soft tissue available. This is the bone loss. We took the bone graft, placed it with the screw, Cover it up, wait four months. Situation after four months, we had a lot of very good bone. We took some off in order to properly place the implant. We took the screw off, place our implant. And this is how we end up uh, after final restoration, but it took eight to 10 months. So we need to talk to our patients about that. In difficult cases, I would say teamwork is very, very important. Walt Disney once said, whatever we accomplish belongs to our entire group and a tribute to our combined effort. In difficult cases, I work with a lot of uh, colleagues. Dr. Roberto Carrillo is uh, one of, uh, the orthodontist I work with, uh, Dr. Arturo Flores is a prosthetic doctor and I do the, the surgical part of, of the work. Now team also uh, means together, everyone achieves more and that could translate to uh, improvement of uh, our cases and a benefit for our patients. And this is very well documented in several papers. So let's take this case that end up like this, but began this way. This is situation when this lady came to us, missing tooth, uh, upper right, uh, left incisor. Uh, we have augmented mesodistal dimensions uh, between laterals, medium gingival biotype, some diastemus, uh, gummy smile. So we have to do orthodontic treatment. We need to uh, place an implant in that area and crowns canine to canine. So this is the beginning of our situation. We are also going to do some uh, uh, periodontal recontouring uh, for aesthetic purposes. This is the ortho setup that uh, we'll want to, to, to correct in order to have same business in the incisors. So that's the orthodontic treatment. And this is a mock-up of how we want to end up uh, our case. We show that to our patient, she accepts. Of course, we still are uh, like that. And we talk about uh, gingival uh, recontouring. This is day of surgery. We use this kind of uh, guide for gingival purposes, but also for the implant placement. We use this bone level SLA active uh, implant and we place the provisional. Now look at the healing. We want to have same height in canines and centrals and 
less height in lateral, of course, in the implant area, we want to have as much soft tissue as we can. These are provisional, and this is the final result. So we change from that to that. This is another complex case, an early ankylosis of uh, right central incisor, in which we have a very complex situation with lack of soft tissue and bone tissue. So that's definitely a challenge. Soft tissue problems, osseous tissue problem, ankylosis, resorption. So uh, what can we do in this uh, situation? Orthodontic extrusion, tooth extraction and socket preservation, extraction, let it heal, and then place a bone graft, guide bone re uh, re regeneration, only bone block, uh, connective uh, tissue graft, uh, extraction and distraction osteogenesis, uh, no reconstruction and use just pink porcelain. So with all these uh, options, we need to pick something because when we see the, the X-ray, the CBCT, and we want to analyze where the implant should be, we definitely uh, have a lack of soft tissue and bone in that area. So of course we cannot do orthodont orthodontic extrusion because it, this is a, an ankylosis. But if we combine that principle with distraction osteogenesis, we could get a very good result. At least that's what we think. So uh, this is what we're planning. Dr. Elisarov uh, proposed distraction osteogenesis several years ago, in which he talked about uh, osteotomy or corticotomy, a Latin period, distraction osteogenesis in 0.5 to 1 millimeter a day, and a consolidation phase to three to four months. Of course, he was working at that time in uh, lung bones, but that can be brought to uh, the alveolar process, of course, and that's what we're planning to do with this kind of uh, device. So we did the osteotomy uh, in order to move this segment. This is published in several papers. So, uh, this is the clinical progress. Things are looking good. We took some CBCT to see the difference. The bone gap is now present during the, the, the distraction. Then a lot wider gap. And this is when you receive a phone call of the orthodontist asking you, do you think we're producing bone, and of course, you talk about, remember that uh, this is an osteoid that uh, is not yet uh, very well uh, uh, mineralized, and that's why it doesn't look like that. On the other hand, you are worried yourself about what is going on, and of course, you start praying that everything looks uh, good at the end. So the progress, was uh, clinically very nice. We did an overcorrection. And after some months, we had that uh, maturation of bone. We extracted the rest of the tooth and uh, we placed uh, our implant in this kind of situation. Now we have a lot of soft tissue and bone, actually more bone than we needed. That's the implant placement. Some uh, soft tissue, uh, connective tissue from the tuberosity. And this is now in uh, provisional. This is a great sculpture by Gian Lorenzo Bernini. He did this being 25, 24 years old. Look at the detail. This is just amazing. Look at the veins, the green coats, the muscles, the ligaments. 
And uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini once said, what we have is given by God and to teach it to others is to return it to him. In my case, I love teaching. I've been teaching for 21 years now. And sometimes we're in the operating room, sometimes we're at the clinic, sometimes we do social work, uh, everything with our students. And I enjoy that a lot. It's a very nice privilege to be with our students and our colleagues working in, in our university. What about implant complications? I showed some pictures of uh, this uh, case. This is an osteointegrated implant with multiple bone uh, graft attempts. This is a 25 years old female, no relevant uh, history, uh, health history. And the implant was placed one year ago. Uh, now is osteointegrated and uh, with that provisional restoration. Patient came to me saying, I was told you could make a successful bone graft. She had a lot of bone graft, at least four bone grafts in this area with that kind of result. So as you can see clinically, this doesn't look good. Positioning is against all what we just have been talking about. Look at the CBCT. It's also integrated, but it's completely out of the abdominal process. So what to do? It is a very problematic situation for the patient that already paid for all those treatments. And then you have to tell her, you're going to lose your implant. So we needed to remove the implant. This is the defect. We now have a very huge defect in soft tissue and bone tissue. But not only that, we have that. And when you look at teeth, we have uh, a malposition situation. Again, you start to worry about what is, is going on in the case. The patient is not happy, we are not happy. And in order to make this a happy end, it's going to take a long, long ride. So the evaluation and explantation took two weeks. We did orthodontic uh, uh, treatment in bone graft that took two months, uh, uh, I mean, 10 months. This is situation after the orthodontic treatment. Now we have uh, some soft tissue, but still a very big uh, bone defect. So we did the reconstruction with a bone block, an onlay block. This is the situation with the screw. Now we have uh, the bone graft healing for four months. We have now 14 months. This is the situation at that time. We're placing our implant. We have a fenestration here. We don't care because this is uh, the right positioning or for the, the position of the, uh, where the implant needs to be. And of course, we're going to use some more bone graft like we did. And then we use this uh, collagen membrane. This is initial uh, healing. Now we have 17 months of treatment. That's a provisional restoration, but we still have some lack of soft tissue here. So in order to try to correct that, we're going to uh, use a connective tissue graft. We now have 18 months of treatment. So uh, we took um, a connective tissue from the palate. We placed the graft, we tried to bring the soft tissue lower. Now we have a lot of soft tissue. Of course, a lot of uh, carrying also for all the treatments uh, she has done. This is initial situation. 
And this is our final situation after 22 months of treatment. This is CBCT at the beginning, and this is CBCT when we finish. Look at the, all the soft tissue here, all the soft tissue thickness and the bone tissue in this area. It is very, very important. So that uh, the kind of changes that we can build in a multidisciplinary way and having a patient that will cooperate with us and uh, is going to be patient for all those steps. So conclusions, in every single case in implant dentistry, we need to have enough bone. If we don't have it, we need to build it. Enough soft tissue, same thing, and adequate three-dimensional implant placement. Now in complex uh, implant cases, I will encourage you to do team analysis and treatment plan. Discussion with the patient, risks, benefits, options uh, of treatment. And of course, evaluate patient expectations. That's extremely important and tell them this is about time. Complex cases will take a long time to treat them the right way. So uh, with that, I would like to say thanks. I would like to end up with this phrase, a great change are always accompanied by a strong shock. It is not the end of the world. It is the beginning of a new one. So uh, I was talking to Constanza and, and, and things are difficult in Chile as well as uh, here in Mexico. And I'm, I'm sure in, in most uh, of the rest of the world, but things are gonna uh, improve from, from now on. We have to be patient. We have to cooperate with the authorities and, and uh, of course, take care of our families. And uh, with that, I will uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. And if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to try to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jorge. It was excellent, your presentation, amazing clinical results. So right now I'm going to give the floor to my colleagues. And welcome to Dr. Rodrigo Marino, who is the director of the U21 Dentistry Group. I don't know if anyone have some questions to Dr. Martinez. And remember that you can write your questions by chat or by the question and answer box. I have one quick question, if possible. Sure. Yes. Sure. Well, thank you very much for, for your great talk, Jorge. It was very fascinating to, to see those results as well. I hope you can hear me good. I have my mask on, so, so I hope it's understandable. My question... Thank you. Perfect. So my question would be, uh, which do you think is the next big step in either material uh, development or uh, implant uh, development that can help uh, try to favor right, a, a good osseointegration integration and avoid peri-implant disease, biofilm formation, et cetera. Because I mean, SLA and, S and SLA Active have been really good. They've shown incredible results for the integration with soft tissues, but there are some reports showing that there's still issues with sometimes uh, biofilm formation and peri-implant disease, and especially the, the decontamination of the surfaces is, is very difficult. So. It will be very interesting to hear your opinion and, and your knowledge on which do you think is the next big step on this field. Thank you. Oh, this is a very good question. I think it is a very difficult one to answer. Of course, it, implants could be great, as you just said, or can be uh, a headache when you have periimplantitis, when you have a bad positioning, when you have an infection. Uh, I think uh, now, things are moving towards uh, having better biomaterials and try to, to create what someday would be or would look like a tooth. However, that is extremely difficult because 
since uh, we know that the tooth has different kind of uh, cells, different kind of uh, uh, embryonic, uh, embryologic uh, types of cells, it is extremely difficult to, to really create a tooth, a natural tooth, I mean. So uh, nowadays, what we uh, have is try to create as a better uh, biologic design. Uh, and now uh, we have not only titanium, but also um, some other materials like zirconium or a mixture of them in order to try to, to avoid uh, uh, some reaction in the body. Uh, there has been uh, this one piece implant uh, without uh, the, the interface, with, which uh, it's a very good uh, idea because of bacteria, but the problem is angulation. In, especially in the anterior area. So uh, again, I think uh, for now, we need to be very careful about uh, doing things uh, slowly. I think we don't have an answer right now about the best option for uh, tooth replacement. But what, what I can tell you is uh, there is a lot of uh, commercial things going on around dental implants. Uh, people is offering having teeth in a day. And as I showed you, sometimes you have to be patient and, and sometimes you have to respect biology, give the patient some time for, for healing and, and do things uh, in a reasonable way. Uh, when, until we have a better option, we need to, to uh, keep uh, respect for biology and, and try to do things properly with the uh, materials we have right now, which is what we already know. Uh, it is, I think the, the next uh, years will be very uh, interesting in terms of, of materials, but now uh, this is what we have uh, for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So Bruno, do you have a question, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's me. Oh, sorry. Okay, go ahead, Rodrigo. Can I go ahead? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, Jorge, for your uh, wonderful and very uh, uh, clear and well um, designed um, presentation. Um, um, well, it's not in, in my uh, specific area of uh, uh, specialization, uh, but uh, my, my question is, um, how, and, and it, it looks like it's very complex. I mean, the, the whole process, and you need a lot of um, uh, consideration uh, for the success of the, of, the, of the implant. Now, there are some um, uh, attempts to use uh, artificial intelligence, especially robotics, uh, to do implants. So, have you? And and, and, and my, when I was uh, listening, I said, "Well, is this possible? Or can this be? Can we uh, uh, progress in, in in that direction?" So, what are your your thoughts in that? Yeah, definitely. Well, first of all, Rodrigo, thanks for being here. Uh, I know it's late. Uh, over there in 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 uh, yeah Australia, but uh, thanks for for being here. Um, uh, yes, robotics. Well, what we have now is, of course, the three D modeling, the the software for plan uh, positioning of the implants, and now we have a virtual navigation. So you can use the CBCT result, the software. In, in, in a virtual navigation for positioning of, of the implant. But this is going towards the better or the best position you can uh, deliver for an implant uh, or for a patient. What I mean by that is all the concepts I uh, showed you um, today, uh, of course, have the, the, the human error. And that uh, virtual navigation, that software, 
uh, that uh, hardware that we can use uh, can make our results a lot better, a lot more precise for positioning, for respecting biology, for respecting the distance, the, the, the uh, quantity of bone. And, and now that's what is uh, happening. So free hand placement of implants is definitely not uh, a very good idea. There is a, a long curve of uh, learning and uh, that's what we're using right now. Uh, that's uh, the, the best way or the, the, most, the most precise way of, of uh, implant placement, but still that's to respect all the concepts that we already talked about. Thanks for your question, Rodrigo. Hi. Hello. Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, it was very interesting and uh, amazing pictures and uh, it was very passionate. So um, I, I just wanna read uh, one question that is in a chat. Um, mm -hmm. Is that if you could point a few key factors to avoid heart tissues alterations when placing an implant in a fresh extraction site? Yeah, the problem with the with the fresh the fresh fresh uh, socket is the angulation of the burr. Uh, as uh, I showed you, the 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 burr can slip and 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 not fall in the area you you would like to. So uh, I would say, uh, try to use the instrument you're uh, used to, to work with. In my uh, personal point of view is using this uh, round burr in order to stop because otherwise the, the, the burr will keep uh, flipping and the positioning will fail and the result would be a, a complication. So uh, try to make a hole in the in the palatal uh, area in order to to get and stop for your birth. and of course always always uh, use um, a guide a guide that will uh, show you since the beginning you are in the right spot for the the final prosthesis. If we don't plan like that, we will have uh, several problems. If we leave those problems to the prostate doctor, uh, we will uh, have a nightmare. Thank you, Jorge. Thanks for your question. You're very welcome. Jorge, thank you again. I have a question. Do you have experience using plasmatic sure. fractions in these cases for increase the, the wound healing for the hard tissues or the soft tissues? Can you? talk about this yes we have some experience but I, I don't well i don't promote that for bone for creating bone because uh, growth factors are very good especially uh, platelet derived growth factors prp um it is it has shown very very nice results in soft tissue healing but it has failed in creating bone. Of course, you can, uh, you can combine uh, growth factors with the bone graft and have very nice results. But the question is, do you really need for creating bone those growth factors? Now, uh, there is, uh, or there are some uh, commercially available uh, growth factors that are extremely expensive. And again, Dr. Robert Marx has shown different results. Uh, uh, with with those, they're not consistent. So I think uh, PRP is a very good uh, uh, tool for soft tissue healing. Well, for creating bone, uh, <clears throat> still we have a, a way to go. <clears throat> I don't think that's the the answer for creating bone right now. A lot of people combine it with a bone graft and has very nice results because of the soft uh, tissue healing around uh, the bone graft. So um, that's uh, my opinion on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we don't have more questions. So uh, I invite to Rodrigo Marino, if you want to say some words to close this activity. 
Rodrigo. Yeah, um, well, thank you very much, um, Constanza. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the um, your effort, your personal effort, and also from the from the university to organize this uh, uh, webinar. Um, as I said before, I, I know that uh, this organizing this um, activity requires a lot of um, um, well, a lot of effort, but organization uh, for for uh, things to happen. Um, and you have done it in a in a weekly basis, which is even even uh, uh, even more uh, uh, challenging. So I uh, really uh, appreciate and congratulate you for for the success of this activity. And I hope that we um, can continue uh, in the new year um, doing this. Uh, we have the technology. We have the 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 the, the passion uh, to do this uh, and. Uh, it's just to uh, to um, um, put everything together so we can we can have that off. Maybe not in a weekly basis, but if we we, we, we think in a monthly or bi-monthly uh, basis, that that would be uh, still a good achievement. So I in, um, invite um, all those who are attending this uh, webinar and other members of the of the group to um, to join us and uh, put forward uh, ideas and and topics for a future presentation. So um, thank you very much, uh, Constanza, to you and, and your team at, at the Catholic University and to Jorge um, and all the other um, presenters before us uh, to make themselves available for, for, for this activity. So, um, well, just to close, um, I wish you all a um, uh, happy uh, uh, holidays uh, and the best uh, for the new years to you and your family. And as Jorge said, even though things look uh, challenging and difficult now, uh, can only improve in the future. Let's, let's wait and work for this uh, better future uh, for us and for, um, for our profession and for our countries. I, I will say good night, but for you, it's good, good morning. <laughs> bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you all. Have a great Christmas. Bye-bye.